<coughs> so I'm going live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Heather Chauvin. Heather, are you ready to be great today? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you, Jason. Love this conversation. Excited. Heather is a leadership coach who helps ambitious, overwhelmed women conquer their fears and become leaders at work and home. Drawing from her professional experience as a social worker and her life experience raising three boys, Heather created a signature approach to help her clients create and enjoy sustainability, profitability, and ease in business and life. She is a host of the Mom Is In Control podcast, where she reveals her most vulnerable truths about womanhood, marriage, parenting, living through stage four cancer, and running a successful business without burning out. She is releasing her first book, first book in 2021. When Heather isn't busy driving her boys to hockey practice, you can find her curled up on the couch next to her husband and playing the next family adventure. Heather, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No hockey practice this year, but yeah. Yeah, not so much, huh? Yeah. So Heather, um, how has how how did being a social worker help you with your new career as being a coach and everything you're doing now? Like how did that translate for you? Yeah, it was actually interesting because I went into school for social work, fell in love with the career, helping people. Um, and then really in that world realized that there was this deeper message that wanted to get out into the world. But we were so focused on you know, what was the problem in front of us? How can we support these families, but not help them break through to the next level? So when I left social work and went into coaching, it really, I feel like it gave me an edge in the sense where I was already used to working with vulnerable populations. I already understood human psychology. I, you know, I worked in the mental health field. Um, but I was also allowed to stand in this like arena and area of how I wanted to show up for people, which was a very unconventional approach, which is very much in alignment with coaching. What do you want? How do you want to feel? What do you want your life to look like? Like, yes, there's the past. Yes, we know what's not working and we still need to look at it and process it and talk about it. But when we're focusing our energy and attention on what we do want, uh, we can create that more. And so that that was really an edge in perspective, but it's also given me a lot of compassion and empathy to know where people are at and how, you know, how they did get in their own way or how they did get to where they are, but there is another way to be in the world. And as a business owner and a mother, um, the coaching world has literally saved my life and I don't know where I would be without it. I don't, I don't think people realize everything a social work has to do, right? I mean, like you're, you're everything to the person, you're a mentor, you're a coach. So that's the figure you, you, you kind of like, like, you know, fine tune your coaching methods when you're doing the social work, correct? And like this made it better once you become a, a full-time coach. Yeah. You're expected to be everything to everyone. <laughs> you're the mentor, you're the coach, you're the caseworker. You are uh, sometimes, you know, running errands with people it just depends on in what capacity but really there's a lot of pressure of who you need to be for people and how you're supposed to change their life and fix them and do all of these things so there's definitely a big a big uh shift in that and it, it was a reprogramming of my brain as well so heather talk about your signature approach you use to help your clients so this is actually interesting because Everyone in the business world or online business world talks about like, what's your signature approach, right? And everyone has a different way of doing things. People are always looking for a blueprint or a strategy. And this is how I started my business. Actually, I started my business because um, I was really struggling, even in, you know, having all the formal education, I was really struggling to understand my children's behavior. And then as I kept jumping outside of conventional wisdom, what I noticed was there was more, there was more, there was more. And it all came back to, you know, what is the communication style? How do you want to feel? But seven years ago, when I was diagnosed with a stage four cancer, and I know we were going to talk about a little bit about that too. Um, I was learning all of this stuff and I was supporting people through mindfulness and really like conscious parenting and understanding their children's behavior and really creating those deeper connections in your relationships and in your intimate relationships.
But what I noticed was I wasn't integrating and practicing. So the way that I support people now, both personally and professionally, is essentially helping them reverse engineer how they want to feel. So first you have to get clear on how you want to feel. We all know how we don't want to feel. What's the opposite of that? And then creating a plan and a strategy to follow through. And then when all your stuff comes up, because it will, because we're human and it's like, oh, what am I avoiding? We don't need to go and search for it. The second you go after what you want, that's where the magic is going to happen. But the lens that I work through is profitability, sustainability, and ease. Profitability to me does not mean money all the time. Sometimes in business it does, but how can we create more energy profit? How can we create more time profit in our lives? Um, and sustainability, I think obviously 2020 has really shown us a lot, but systems, there's so many systems out there that are not sustainable. And especially for women who are trying to raise children and whether it's raise a business or raise a career, um, it's just not sustainable. And they keep putting more and more and more on their plate. So that's the lens that I work with people through. So Heather, what's been your process of getting people to be open, transparent, and, and honest in, in this process? versus like hiding the true sauce from you? How do you get up? How do you get them to open up, so to speak? Well, I think one, I think it's being a role model. So a lot of people come to me because they're listening to my podcast and I share my own truths. I share my own journey. Um, I think when we are, when we become vulnerable storytellers, we give other people permission to do the exact same thing. Um, so it's really holding those containers of space and saying, listen, I may be the leader here and I'm not going to dump all my stuff onto you, but I'm going to show you that I've, I've been in similar situations. I've had those, you know, holy crap moments. I've been back against the wall. I've been paralyzed in fear. I've been broke. I've been on welfare. I've been the single parent. Now, listen, there is another way to be. So I think showing up as the leader of what you want to attract is really, really important. But also, I've noticed that there are levels of vulnerability. So I just trust that when somebody comes in, it's a constant surrendering process. Um, and I watch it like, and if everything is working for you, that's great. If it's not, your life is trying to show you something and you have to pay attention. So again, compassion and non-judgment have been my greatest teachers. Hello, who's your, your like I'll say stereotypical customer, like who, who's like your perfect demographic, so to speak, that you're trying to reach out to? So she's typically a mother of any kind. And what I mean, when I say any kind, there's different ways that we mother people, but she's raising humans. Um, and she also has this deep, deep desire, or she keeps telling herself like, is this it? Is this it? Is this all there is in life? Um, she might have a desire to start her own thing, or she just has a desire to, you know, be triggered less and to have more energy and to have more time and find that sense of purpose and fulfillment. Um, and you know what, she might have some type of health crisis. I don't attract a lot of people who, because I have a, you know, my own cancer story, I don't attract a lot of people who have had cancer, but, um, I do notice that a lot of people that I attract have had some type of trauma in their life and it has woken them up to, this is not how I want my story to end. This is not the legacy I want to leave for my children. I wanna break generational patterns. I wanna become more and they're willing to do the work. So Heather, you know, there's the, the, the stereotype out there, you know, the person has it all, you know, like CEO of the company, yeah. perfect husband, perfect kids, all the kids are doing great, 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 everything's great. I'm guessing you don't agree with this stereotype, do you? Well, it looks good on the outside, right? It looks what, what's really the cost, good. right? Yeah, it looks really good on the outside. Um, but when there is a disconnect, you will see it. You will see it. Maybe the cracks aren't revealed right away, but they're feeling it. So it, you know, there's that saying, what you resist will persist. And I used to believe that like, oh, when I make this much money, when my kids are this blah, 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 then I can. And when you're chasing something outside of yourself, 
um, it's eventually going to catch up to you. You're like, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, right? You're checking all the boxes, but whose boxes are you checking? You're checking societal expectations of who you need to be, which is great. You've been able to manifest, you have done the work. And now you're just like, this doesn't feel good. So I'm like, you can have all of that. And you can also do it in a way where it feels really, really good to you. So, you know, the more I've had the privilege of look at, you know, get people giving me access to them behind the scenes and telling me their deepest, darkest secrets and shame and fears and how whatever's coming up for them. Um, it's not all rainbows and kitty cats on the other side of the fence, but you know, when we're, when our perception is, you know, my goal is to make this much money, but yet you're doing it in a way where you're slowly killing yourself or you have no energy or every day's, a, you know, feels like such a drain. How is that freedom? Like we're forgetting why we started the business. We're forgetting why we wanted the family. We're forgetting. It's like, don't forget how you want to feel and also realize you have so much more control than you give yourself credit for. But here's the thing. People want instant results and they also don't understand how to master resistance and how to co-create with you know, what their soul is craving. And you know, some of these words, people are like, what? What does that mean? But it's like, why are you attracted to podcasting? And someone else is like, I would never podcast. It's like, that's the point, right? Like you have to go towards what feels good to you and everyone else can do their thing. Hey, the next, let's talk about your battle with cancer. Now, when you found out you had cancer, it was like straight to stage four, correct? Yeah, I feel like there's different, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the stages were probably there for a little bit, but I avoided it. I. I told myself the same thing that everyone else says. I don't have time. I don't have time. Taking care of myself is selfish. I'm taking away from everybody else. Um, but then I realized, you know, post diagnosis that a lot of those stories and fears that I were telling or the stories I was telling myself were fears. And I was actually running away from my truth. And my truth was to face my biggest fear that I was sick. And once I was diagnosed, I had this like internal, and I don't know, Jason, if you've ever had this moment, but like, it was confirmation. They're like, you're sick. And I'm like, I know, like I already knew on a deep, deep level, but I was running away from that. So yeah, I just bought into the good that women are supposed to be, you know, you, if you're not exhausted, if you're not hustling, if you're not go, 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 um, you're not successful. You're not good. And you know, immediately because I was investing in coaching, I was going to the retreats. I was doing the workshops. I was like, I'm done. This is me now. This is my lane. Who do I want to be? How do I want to feel? No more outside BS. So I, I mean, obviously I'm not a cancer expert, but correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no stage five, right? It's stage one, two, three, and stage four is the last stage, right? From my understanding, yes, but also I do believe there's more science coming out now that there is different stages for different cancers. But the statement in the book that says there is no stage five, meaning like my brain was going to, oh, I'm diagnosed, like I'm probably stage one, I'm young, I still have so many years to like, I literally thought this, I have so many years to burn myself out, right? And they're like, no, Heather, like you're not gonna make it a month, like this is rapid growing. Like you have to stop, you have to stop. And this needs to become your number one priority. You don't get to like pretend that this isn't a big deal. So what made you, you know, you ignored it for a while with me. What made you like, what was the moment you said, okay, Heather, you need to go to the doctor and at least get this checked out. What made you do that? What was the catalyst for that? Pain. I was in a lot of pain. Um, I have an extremely high tolerance for pain. Um, my husband also really advocated for me to go. And um, yeah, I had pain. And then it was like, my body was trying to cope with the pain. So it was numbing me. And I kept saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I actually went to the emergency room the first time. My husband stayed home with the kids and I left because I didn't feel like I was sick enough to be there 
On the outside, I look fine. I did have a swollen abdomen. I was losing weight rapidly, but I looked normal, right? I didn't have blood gushing from me. And even when I checked in, I was, you know, I'm like, I'm here for abdominal bloating and mild back pain. And she looked at me like, that's why you're here. And I was like, thank you. Confirmation that I shouldn't be here. So I actually left. And the next day, my husband said, we're going back and we're not leaving that hospital until you get checked out. And yeah, in hindsight, I was just running from my fear. So when the doctor actually told you you had cancer and confirmed you pretty much all you knew, was a sense of relief or how did that, how did that work for you? Um, I immediately, I was like terrified and then it wasn't a sense of relief. Um, I, yeah, I was just, I couldn't run away from my fear anymore. If that makes sense. Like my fear of dying, my fear of everything. Like I just, I couldn't avoid it. And so it, it actually forced me to run towards it. And there's a story that I tell in the book where I was walking outside, it was raining. It was a few days before um, Christmas. And so where I'm from, it should be snowing and cold and it was raining and everything just slows down. Like, you're just like, whoa, <laughs> like everything, time doesn't matter anymore. You're just like very reflective. Your brain goes into survival mode. Um, and I just remember like standing outside, my husband's walking to the car and I, I was just, I stopped and I looked up and I said, you finally have my attention. I didn't know what or who I was talking to because I was, I was the center of my universe. And what I mean by that is I can do it all. I'm going to do it all. But I always believe in God, universe, angels, like something bigger than me and my relationship immediately with something bigger than me. Um, shifted. And I said, I will listen to you. And what I meant by that was I will listen to that part of myself or that little voice or that knowing that is trying to guide me somewhere. Um, and so I just got really quiet and I started listening. And then I had to give myself permission to take action on my knowing, trusting myself um, trusting the signs, trusting whatever was coming to me from a deep, 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 deep level. And um, I think that's part of the journey of being human and yet something that, you know, is so easy to discount. So Heather, are, are you cancer free now? I am. Yeah. Good. Good. I, I went in here. remission rather quickly. Um, it's, it's been, I would say now that I'm healthier than I've ever been in my entire life. My perspective, I mean, you definitely go through different levels, but my perspective now is how good can it get? So just because something is gone out of your life or you're out of the woods, that's you, you, you are now out of survival mode. And now it's like, what's the next level? What's the next level? What's the next level? And I'm not blind to the fact that um, health is wealth, right? It is something, it's a privilege, it's an opportunity. It could be taken away from you at any time. So I'm always thinking about like, how can I continuously fill up my cup? How can I, you know, what's the next level, level of health and opportunity? And it blows my mind. You know, why did I, and I know I'm not alone, but why did things need to get so bad in order to know that you know, this level of energy and abundance and health was possible and vitality um, that, you know, the cycle is never ending and there's always more that you can create. And I'm just so excited and grateful that, yeah, not only am I in remission, but I'm so far removed from that woman that I was then. So Heather, uh, getting more personal, I mean, I don't know, the, but what are the stats like the cancer coming back, right? Is that something you have to worry about? There's like precautions you can take as well as health. Dr. Happy Out Medicine, uh, how, how does that work for you? The type that I had, and I'm definitely not a physician or educated in this aspect, um, the type that I had, the remission rate was, it would come back within a year. Um, I'm not on an, any medication. And also when I was diagnosed, I realized that cancer is unique to every single body, right? Like. There could be a specific type that you have, but then maybe you have underlined other issues and things like that. So, or side effects from um, medication that you took. So 
Yeah. I, I know that my vulnerable state was within the first, the first year. Um, and then I just did whatever I could in integrative medicine, you know, conventional and non-conventional medicine and touched every aspect of my life, my mental, physical, emotional, spiritual life satisfaction, relationship satisfaction, um, to remove myself from that. Heather, so I'm a big believer that everything has a part of, a part of spin on this. And I think for you, for this, this experience was a catalyst for you to write your book, correct? It definitely was a catalyst to write the book, but I've had a desire to write a book probably for 15 years. Like motherhood was essentially the thing that cracked me open. Um, and the desire was there. It's like, you know, when you're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if that was always there? And then when I got cancer, cancer to me was that like punch in the face moment that just was like, stop, like I'm done suffering. No more, no more, no more. Like every, I was, it was like, I was doing all the work and then that was like go time. So, so in a strange is, way, so in a strange way, I kind of focused you. It focused me and it was like, what's, you know, what's important to you? What's your priority? And it definitely was a big, you know, the book dying to be a good mother is, was a big catalyst for, you know, for this or cancer was a big catalyst for the book. But if it's not cancer, we're dying in other aspects of our life. So it talks about, it's a, a prescriptive memoir. It talks about my cancer story, but it also talks about my experience, you know, in my corporate job and my love and passion for helping children. Um, and that, you know, we can be who we want to be as women and mothers and raise the children that we want to be. And this belief that giving to ourselves in any capacity takes away from other people, which is what we've been conditioned to believe for generations and generations is literally killing us. Heather, was the writing the book harder, the process harder or easier than I thought it was going to be, than you thought it was going to be? <laughs> That's a complicated question. <laughs> um, what I've discovered is every author has their own experience. And I tried to write the book myself for years. And then when I kind of surrendered and gave myself permission and said, how can I do this in alignment with how I want to feel? Like, what would I tell a client or someone else? It was, I needed to co-create with somebody. So I hired a writer, also did not know because I feel like there's one of the things that I really try to do is be honest. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who write books that have writers and there's no shame in that. But it, I actually, after that process, I realized I would be doing the reader a huge disservice to believe that I had to do this all myself. And it goes back to believing we have to do everything ourselves. So that writer really helped me to pull it out of me. But I had so much resistance. Like, having somebody on my team to be like, come on, let's go. I need that story. I need this. I need that. And just working through the resistance. Um, there were moments when I wanted to give up and there were moments when um, I actually said, this is, this is better than 10 years of therapy. I'm like, why didn't I do this earlier? So mm -hmm. rapid healing and rapid resistance. So this person that helped you out, did you have to like, but first of all, how do you even find this person? What was the process of that? And second question, do you have to like pay them a amount of money up front? Do you give them like a percentage of the royalties? How does that work? Yeah, so I think every deal and publication is is going to be different. So I went a hybrid publishing route. So it's kind of like traditional slash, um, uh, not traditional, traditional and self help mixed together. I my intention for the book was to have really good quality. Like I wanted to hold the book and feel like this is you could buy this in a bookstore. Um, but I did decide to go for a, a hybrid version, which means. I paid every cent out of my, out of my pocket. Um, and yeah, I had to pay a lot of money for this writer because she's a genius and I had to pay that out of pocket as well. So every deal is going to be different. Um, and it was a referral. It was kind of like a dating game because I also wanted to ha like co-create this experience with somebody who was in alignment with my mission, who got me, who saw me, who could challenge me. Um, you know, our personalities mixed and somebody who could hold the deadlines and all of that. So I'm just 
I always tell her every day, I'm like, you, I, I just feel like you were sent to me and it was meant to be. Um, but it was a referral from like all of these little programs and everything that I was tra- taking to try to figure it out. So I had the, as far as the actual process, did you like, like every day, like schedule two hours a day to focus on the book? Was this like, when you've had like, whenever you felt like it, like how did that work out for you? So first of all, the process of writing the book and then leading up to that, very different. So once I made the commitment to actually write the book, um, I, for my experience, the writer and I did interviews, like she would interview me like this. Um, and then I would send her audios. So she would either interview, ask me questions, record them, transcribe them, pick apart. Um, I am, I love habits, uh, but I am not a consistent person and I'm a rebel. So if somebody makes me do something, I'm going to run the opposite way. So it was a give and take. Sometimes there was, you know, periods where I had to, you know, get things done and put an hour aside a day or 30 minutes a day. I also noticed that when I had a lot of resistance, you know, the all or nothing mindset, I would really um, break it down into smaller bits. So I'd be like, okay, only 10 minutes today. And then of course, once you get into it, it was easier. So I tried to chunk it down into smaller bites, Um, but I physically did not do a lot of the writing. I spoke everything out. I had to really step into that within myself that I, I, I'm a podcaster, I'm a speaker, I'm a coach, and I'd much rather get in the, the mud with people. Um, and then once that was done, I still had a huge part in the creative of it, making sure that every word felt like me. So then after we would read it, and if I didn't feel like this is not what I would say, this isn't the truth, you know, then we would go back and forth again. So, um, I just really tried to chunk down my time and notice that when I had big resistance and I was avoiding it or saying, oh, I'll I'll put aside three hours later. That was my like hit that I needed to chunk it down even more. Um, And we made it happen. Deadlines are a beautiful thing. Heather, during this process, during the interview, any time you say, you know what, this might be a little too personal to share. And then you went ahead and shared it anyway. Yeah. And how do you, how did you get over that hurdle, so to speak? Uh, I don't really think I'm over it yet, Um, meaning I did it, but one of the things that I was told was just pretend nobody's going to read the book, pretend, you know, like make it small and then worry about that. So I couldn't go into that space of, oh my gosh, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if I had to just come back and um, and really focus on the impact. And I know that the more vulnerable we get when it is from a storytelling position to really help people transform their life, you can't, you can't like, you got to put it all out there. And I really, really wanted to do that. So I know my stuff's going to come up when people start reading the book and people have started reading the book and they're like, you know what, this, this has helped me and it's made a big impact. Thank you for sharing that story. I have to make it something bigger than myself, but I still do feel the fear and vulnerability of putting it out there. It's like being on that show naked and afraid. (laughs) Yeah. That's a great analogy. So Heather, what advice do you have for people who, you know, are scared to put themselves out there, right? I'm a big believer as an entrepreneur, you got to put yourself out there, right? You got to mm-hmm. show you all your scars and flaws. Yeah. But, you know, some people are people, right? What advice do you have for them? You know, no, actually, it's a good thing to put yourself out there. The interesting part is I didn't, I never intended to become an entrepreneur. I, like, I would say I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I also, I just kept following the passion. But with that, I was like, I do not understand how business owners and entrepreneurs do not use personal development as part of their business strategy. Like, I feel like business, marriage, parenting, if you're not doing the inner work, it's not going to work. Like, or your life is going to be very, very difficult. Dive in, dive into the deep end. Why are you triggered? Like, what are your habits? How good can you feel? And there is this movement, I see it in, you know, the do less, work smarter, not harder, like all of the cliche things. Um, Yes, people still tell you to hustle and sleep is for sissies and all of that, but it's not sustainable. You're not going to get there. I really, you know, the entrepreneur business person, it's like the more you invest in you, the more you can give back. 
And when I'm showing up for myself, I can show up for my community so much more. And I try intentionally to share my truths and my pitfalls because then I'm giving that other person permission. There's nothing like, and Jason, I don't know if you've ever had this moment where you're challenged with something or you're focused on something and then you're talking to someone or you're listening to a podcast or reading a book and that person's telling you the five different ways that they had to figure this out to get to what fit for them. And you're like, oh, there wasn't a one and done. And you can take little pieces from everything. So I think the more we share, the more open we are without trying to, you know, hide our secrets. Like there are no secrets. You just have to take the messy action. And that is so incredibly uncomfortable for, you know, the ambitious driven brain. Um, but you got to do the inner work because it's eventually going to catch up to you. Heather, so there's someone out there and they're, they, they're saying, no, I'm going to write a book about blank. What would you tell this person? Make sure you want to read it. <laughs> Make sure you want to read the book and make sure you're doing it for yourself. Uh, like, you know, what, what is the desire behind writing the book? For me personally, it was an inner, I knew I, it just wouldn't leave me alone. And I hear people all the time being like, I should write a book. And I'm like, if you think you should do anything, you probably shouldn't do it. Like this book wouldn't leave me alone. It just kept coming. The desire was there and there and there. But if you're doing it for ego or you're doing it for quote unquote money, you might sell books. But once people open it up, they're going to be like, this is crap. So make sure it's a quality product that you want to read yourself and allow it to be fun, allow it to be exciting, allow it to be creative for you. And then keep asking yourself, like, why am I resisting this or what do I need to move this forward? What type of person, what type of program, what type of education, collaboration? Um, and also what I'm learning now, what I've learned through the publication process is, um, and what my writer told me was don't back down what you want. So there was a, after the writing was done and we moved on to the publication process, there was a period where I started to say, sure, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I proved that. And she's like, why are you doing that? She's like 100% of women I work with do this. 100% of men that I work with do not do this. So stand up, stand in your power and keep, keep communicating what you need. And that is, I would say one of the biggest things is what this book has taught me is to keep taking a stand for your vision. Heather, so once someone reads your book, what do you want? Do you want what kind of do you want them to have a certain feeling, a certain experience? Like, some what do you want them to like have once they read your book? Yeah, so I always say this isn't a parenting book. Um, it's my journey, but I also incorporate my coaching into it. But I want you to feel like you're not alone on every page. And you can close it, you know, after five pages, you can close it, you can come back to it, you can dog ear it, you can highlight it, do whatever. But one, you're not alone. Two, there's hope and possibility in your life. There is another way to be. Um, and you're not failing. You're not failing. Your life is just showing you what is not working. And there is no one right way. I do find in business and life, you know, here's my six step process and formula to making a million dollars or getting your kids to bed or blah, blah, blah. And so many of my clients are like, I'm in the moment as my child's having a tantrum or I'm losing my mind. And all I'm thinking about is what was that strategy on page 100? that, you know, like the six steps, I'm like, no, I want you in the moment. I really want women to know they're not alone and to trust themselves. So Heather, I think it's in your website or someplace else. There's a picture of um, two words, hustle and align. Hustle, you have crossed out and yeah. align the bottom. Can you explain that concept? Well, hustling didn't work for me. So if it's working for you, keep at it. I think also everyone um, defines hustle differently. 
I can get things done when I need to get things done. Hustle to me is go, 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 go until you drop. Alignment to me, and you can redefine these words or make up your own words for you. You don't need to be me. I hope you're not. Align to me is what feels good. And also knowing the difference between what feels good versus resistance, because resistance doesn't feel good, but you still have to push through it, right? So you can't stop, avoid it and be like, I just want to feel good all the time. No, there's rainy days. There's days when the sun doesn't come out. We have winter seasons where we're all hibernating. Um, it can't be summertime all the time and perfect weather. And that's, that's what the hustle or the alignment versus hustle is to me is the more aligned you are of like, this is the vision. These are the actions that I need to take. This is where I want to invest my time, my money, my energy. This is how I want to feel in my life. This is the model of business or, you know, personal that I want to embody. So when we're staying in our own lane and focused on that, that is alignment. Um, and I have no interest in hustle, but I can definitely get shit done if I need to. So Heather, how hard is it in your experience for your coaching people to get them aligned to what they, what they want to do? So I don't have to do any of the work. This is something I've really been working on as a woman. Um, I would say a recovering rescuer and fixer, you know, we want to help everyone or anyone who has a passion. It's not my job to do the work for somebody else, right? What's that saying? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't get them to drink. So you know, that's why I have the book. That's why I have the podcast. I understand it takes time to, to bloom, to grow things in a garden. And the first time when people are like, oh, poor me or oh, poor me. And, you know, you, I can just see them filled with excuses and I see the possibility for them. I will simply say like, go listen to the podcast, like go engage with my free content. If you like it, come closer. If you don't, don't, but I get to choose, you know, how long I'm going to listen to somebody's excuses. So I also have boundaries. There's different levels of support that I offer people and I have different expectations for those different levels of support. So when you get like one-on-one -on -one access to me, you better understand that your excuses are excuses and we can work through that and process it. Um, but also at the same time, if you're willing to invest big money in yourself, be willing to be uncomfortable, be willing to show up big. So yeah, I show up and do my work and I show up for other people, but it is resistance and that's the point, right? Like I, I made it my life commitment and I still have to recommit every single day and I still have to practice what I preach. So when someone's like, I'm done, I'm good. I'm like, tell me your secret. Like it's, it's a journey. Um, but there is a lot of resistance because we have belief systems and we have stories and we have family and we have culture that is constantly coming at us, telling us you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you have to have that inner conviction. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's a patience game, but I'm also willing to take a stand for people and remind them, you know, why are you here? What do you want? Um, but those are typically the people that are like, I know I'm going to fall and I'm willing to get back up and to try again. So Heather, you already talked about this a little bit, but how do you make sure that potential clients are actually a match for you? Um, we do an intro call. So there's different, so there's an a entry level program that I do called courageous rewrite. And that really teaches women about, you know, my signature process, like getting super clear on the life that you want, how you want to feel and reverse engineering that and teaching them energetic time management that you can register anytime. Well, when it's open, the next level is mastery. And then I have mastery business and we do an intro call. And so you know, it's really, it's almost like dating or um, an interview for a job. It's like, what are your expectations? What do you want to get from this? Where are you going? And then, you know, if we feel that there's anything that's going to get in their way, we let them know up front. Um, and then also letting them know the expectations from me and my team and my community and 
just being very crystal clear on what you offer, the value you can give, and then also letting people know. And then if they're like, mm, it doesn't feel like a win-win, great, no strings attached, or oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need and I'm terrified. It's like, we got this, let's go. So um, helping people process through that emotional stuff. But I, I've been doing this long enough now where I can tell if somebody's ready or if they're not, if they say they're ready, but they're not really gonna commit to the work. Um, you can be scared and take action anyways. You have to be open to receive help. Heather, can you talk about the points of vision planning and mind mapping? Yes. So. I've actually, I don't remember the last time I've created a vision board, but most people are familiar with vision boards, right? You see it, you see it, it's there. And you may be a visual learner, you may be a verbal processor, you may be a written person, like it's okay, like find your way. But the vision is the desire to me. The vision is, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Like create the space to get super clear on the vision. and. Your vision might be 10 years from now. That's okay. Um, put it all out there, right? Don't be attached to it. Be like, I want this. Put it all out there. Mind mapping, I did not create mind mapping. But for me, as a visual learner, really helps me break down a big vision into actionable steps. So I will take one of those things that I want to manifest or I want to bring into my life and then I just start asking myself, like, what do I need to change? What do I need to do? Who do I need to become? And kind of like, it looks like a sun and you're kind of like making little spider legs and, you know, and then you just go from there, go from there. And I, I sit with these mind maps and that's what I look at every day and every week and say, okay, what action do I need to take today to get me closer to that vision? So it's breaking down a big concept into little concepts and then sticking with it. Um, I know for me, my resistance, because people will be like, oh, I can't, blah, blah, blah. My resistance is to avoid looking at the mind map. I'm like, oh, I don't know where I put that. Oh, um, I forgot. I just forgot. So now I write them. I have one right here. I put them on like big, you know, those big post-its, those like you put on the wall. It's like everywhere all the time. So that's what I'm like bringing in. Um, and reminding me, where do you need to focus your energy and attention? So Heather, you did a TEDx talk a few years ago. Yep. Can you talk about why you decided to do a TEDx talk? I just want to scare the crap out of myself. I thoroughly enjoy scaring the crap out of myself. I know that everything I desire is on the other side of fear. Um, so the bigger the fear, the more I got to run towards it. It was an opportunity um, and I took it. And yes, the TEDx name always looks good for brand awareness and things like that. But I also loved their structure. So a lot of the talking that I do, keynotes, podcasting, you know, it's on my terms, but it's, I love challenging myself. So getting into somebody else's framework and then working it out. I also noticed that when I sign up for things like that, it makes me process. Um, and the title dying to be a good mother, which is the book was the title of the TEDx and it almost like brought me closer to the book. So it was really interesting. My husband has a video of me the night before. This is so embarrassing. He has a video of me the night before and I was in the car and we were going for a rehearsal and I was crapping my pants. Like I was so nervous and I'm like, what if, what if, what if, like the fear was just pulsing through my veins and he took a picture of me. He's like, I'm going to show you this tomorrow and you're going to laugh at yourself. I was terrified and so excited and so grateful that it was done. So you've only done one TEDx talk, right? Yeah. Can we expect some more from you? Cause I looked at a YouTube, it's a, it's a great talk. You should think about doing more of those. I've done two speaker competitions. Um, I did a speaker slam. We it's in Toronto. I think you can check it out like speakerslam.ca and they take, I think they're now taking international people. That was a different type of talk, very different than TEDx. That scared the crap out of me too, but I, I'll be doing more definitely in the coming years. Heather, next talk about the, uh, it's called red, yellow and green zones that you talk about. Yes. So this is something, so it's in the book. I don't know what chapter it is, maybe four or five, six, who knows? Um, red, yellow, and green. I want you to think of a traffic light. 
right? We all know what to do in the green, you go in the yellow caution, you have to stop uh, or slow down soon. And red is like, stop, don't move. I think this was back in the day when I was really struggling to understand my children's behavior. And I find, and I've said this many times in, in conversations and speaking, um, and I did this at my son's school, and I think it was the principal or one of the teachers came up to me and she's like, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. The number one feedback I get about the red, yellow, and green is, people are trying to solve problems in their red zone. So you're anxious, you're angry. What do you do? Your child did something, you're yelling at them, right? You're combative, you and your partner, boom, 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 boom. You can't solve problems in your red zone. Your red zone is also in a crisis state. So here I am, if I'm going back to cancer, stage four cancer, and I'm thinking about running a marathon. There's a little bit of work I need to do before I can do that. And so I always tell people, try to live in your green zone as much as possible, but everyone resists feeling good. When things are good, they're like, I'm gonna stop the habits. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull back a little bit. No, in the green zone is when you're like, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next? And this yellow zone, I hear people all the time going, my child's behavior or my behavior or anything else, you can use it under any lens of your life, goes from green to red. There's no yellow. Like you just don't understand, Heather. And like, there is a yellow zone. You're just not paying attention to it. There are things that are happening in your mind, in your body, your bank account, your time, your schedule, but you're not looking at it. You're not saying, oh, when I feel this way, then I have to do this. When my child says this, we all know what it looks like to have an angry human around us who's hungry. Okay, maybe you got to throw some snacks at them a little bit quicker. It's just intuitively understanding what's happening before things explode in your life. Hey, look, let's say that someone's out there and, and, they, and they tell themselves, you know what, I, know, I need to find a coach. I need to get better. A I, I coach can make me better. What advice do you have this person to find the coach that is the best, best match for them? So for me, when I started, um, I found my first coach and mentor actually through a Facebook ad um, and it bought me in and she changed my life. But I say, go, you know, if you can go to the bookstore, look online where you can buy a book, type in your, you know, what you're looking for, listen to podcasts and pay attention to who and what, you know, philosophy is lighting you up. Like what is like, ooh, I wanna know more. And then just keep going closer to that person. Listen, what, look, pay attention to their offerings. Um, how can you get more involved in their world? And that's exactly what I did. And I asked myself, what's the next, you know, area of my life that I wanna focus on? And who do I know that has already accomplished that goal? And then I asked them, like, it could be somebody in my own life. Like, hey, how did you do that? And they're like, oh, this book changed my life or this person changed my life. So ask yourself, where do I want to focus my energy and attention? Who do I feel connected to right now? And then fill out their application, buy their program, take the action and do the work. So Heather, you know, you have a lot going on. How do you prioritize your schedule to make sure you focus on the things you need to focus on versus just like being all over the place? Like you have a process or you just wake up every day and wing it. Like how do you take care of everything you need to take care of? Yeah, so um, it's a process that I, I don't wanna say mastered because I think I'm always a student. Definitely energetic time management. So it's the process that I teach and it's about reverse engineering how you want to feel but what I'm noticing step, especially jumping into this new level of like book launch, all of that and running the business and having the three boys and household and all of that. One, I do not need to do it all. Write that down. I don't need to do it all. And when I feel guilty or afraid, um, I got to dissect that thought. I got to process that. I have to work through it. So the capacity is there. Um, team, team team, healthy, thriving business, healthy, thriving life, you are not doing it all. So I'm asking myself, am I in alignment right now? Am I feeling the way that I want to feel? If the answer is no, 
okay, how quickly can I pivot and get back to that? Uh, it might take a week, it might take a few days, it might take five minutes, um, paying attention to that. Who can do this quicker or better? Or who else can do this? I don't have to. I also find for women, we have trust issues and men, everyone, every human has trust issues. I can get this done, it's only five minutes. But if I'm in the middle of doing something that's gonna expand my, my life, my business, my parenting, my relationships, why, again, I'm taking away, thinking that doing these things are taking away, but I'm actually giving to other people. I'm giving them a job, I'm giving them um, opportunity, and it gives them opportunity to support me as well. So communication is big of what I need, but also everyone else around me. So making sure that my husband, I'm like, what do you need today? Like, how can we make that happen? My team, are you guys good? Do we need to add somebody else? Do we need to pivot? Is there anywhere where you're feeling drained, angry, anxious? What do you need? Um, it's been a game changer. And I, I do less than I've done before, but it perceives that I do a lot because I'm more visible. Um, and yes, I have a lot going on, but I'm not taking, I'm not making it all happen. Heather, can you talk about an entrepreneurial challenge you've had to overcome during your entrepreneurial journey? Like every day. Um, oh man. I have so many stories that I could tell. I, the early days were really difficult. Um, I remember, so this, I had to overcome a lot in business. But, and what the hardest thing is you don't understand that you're, it's like we're, when you're in it, you don't actually understand how far you've come. But I remember in my early days, wanting to make more money, put things out there. And then something as simple here, let me tell you this first. I was like, which story am I going to tell you? When I had cancer and I was going through chemo, um, we were not in a good financial place and I had to work. And as a small business, as a self-employed, you don't have the luxury of going to your boss and saying, hey, can I have sick leave? I'm dying. No, you are the boss. I did not set myself up for success. I was doing coaching calls from my hospital bed while chemo was literally being injected into my body. The negative of that was I couldn't just focus on getting healthier. I had to focus and work. The positive to that was that I love my job so much and it gives me so much life that I actually felt better after those conversations. I was still able to be present for them, but I will tell you right now, one of the biggest fears most entrepreneurs have is the fear of losing it all which is why the opposite of that is creating more right so when covid hit um it was deja vu and i looked at my husband and said we're fine we're gonna be okay i've been here before and we've prepared for it so even if nobody heard from me for six months we were gonna be okay and this is why we need more, not only, you know, to wait for bad things to happen, but I was also didn't have to make money and I was able to give back to my community. So it's seeing those really challenging opportunities when you were like, I'm not going to live through this and convincing yourself, like looking in the mirror and be like, yes, I will. Yes, I will. What's the next step I need to take? Um, in my early days, what I was going to say is I was just doing like $10 workshops, $10 workshops. And I remember one workshop I had, and I think I put the price up to 50 or a hundred dollars. And that was terrifying to me. And I put it out there and I had one or two people sign up. So I decided to cancel it. And I was terrified to even just do it. I was so much energy, like so much fear-based energy around it. And I canceled it and I gave the money back. And this woman yelled at me and she was like, yeah. And I knew she was really mad because she needed it. And it's like, as a business owner, people are constantly projecting their crap onto you, right? They're like, eh. and you're like, 
do you not know what's going on over here? Like, I, I, I can't, I'm not going to run that. I can't even pay the rental fee. Right. So it's really, it was, there's been so many times where you're just like hit gut punch, punched in the face. And then you have to like rebound and come back and see, like she's projecting her anger. And so I would got on the phone with her and I was like, how can I be of service to you? You got to face the anger. You have to face the fear. You have to face what you don't want to face in order to grow. Heather, can you talk about the points of being resilient as an entrepreneur? Yeah. I feel like, I don't want to say it's an active choice. Like, I think as humans, our natural instinct is to survive. Um, post cancer, pre cancer, pre motherhood, I felt like I wasn't worthy of being on this earth. Like I truly didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't see the point in living. Um, I actually tried to end my life multiple times when I was a teenager, nobody knew. And what I noticed was when I was backed into a corner and the universe was like, you don't want to live. You really don't want to survive my natural human instinct to survive kicked in. And it was like, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. And oftentimes I find that in these moments of risk and resilience, as one, as parents, we're terrified to put our children in discomfort and uncomfortable situations. But it's when you are under that extreme pressure, you grow, right? That's how diamonds are polished. And then when you get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm out of the woods, you still need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, which is why I purposely challenge myself in areas, whether it's physical health and I hire, you know, a fitness coach who's going to challenge my nutrition and workout. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. You're, it's like this pressure cooker. And then all, it's like my instant pot. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you come out, you're like, perfect juicy chicken. Oh, I love the fluffy rice. You have to be put under pressure in order to grow. And when you were put under pressure, you are either going to rise or you are going to hide. And for whatever reason, I have always chosen to rise. Even if I just, I had to give myself moments to hide and cry and get angry and give up and then get back up. It's like being in a punching ring. Um, and I see such a correlation with relationships, whether it's parenting, partnership and business, you need to just show up again and again and again and again and evidence on the days. Cause I still have days. We look at people who have quote unquote made it and we're like, oh, their life is so easy now. No new level, new devil. But on those days where I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. As long as you get one client and you're like, how did I get that client? How did they come to me? Okay, I'm gonna do more of that. Look at the evidence of how you've been able to succeed and then continue giving that evidence more, 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 more. But resiliency is like, I don't wanna say it, it's essential. It's essential to be any thriving human or species. Um, but it's also earned. Heather, next, let's talk about imposter syndrome. So now you always see on TV or wherever, like someone famous or well-known talking about having imposter syndrome and, you know, I'm a phony, like, yeah, whatever. Like you're lying. You got it all taken care of your, you know, you got it going on and then it hits you. You're like, everyone thinks I'm doing well, but I'm a phony. I'm not doing it right. I have all these flaws. Yeah. How do you recommend people deal with this imposter syndrome? So. I definitely feel like you need a community around you of honest people, like people that you can trust that when you say, is this true? Or like, do you, how do you see it from an outsider? Like you need those people that you can have those deep, intimate, you know, connections with essential, essential back pocket, pick the phone up. But I think we've glorified this word imposter syndrome. Like it's really just fear. And if it's not fear, it's guilt. And if it's not guilt, it's resistance. Like 
it's not just imposter syndrome. Like it's not, you weren't diagnosed with it. It's <laughs> like, where did it come from? Right. People are like I have imposter syndrome. I have all these sticky notes around me. It's like, look at, I'm wearing it as a badge of honor. I have imposter syndrome. I'm like, good for you. So, do, oh, now it's in my hair. Good for you. So do I. Right. So I look at it. I write it down. I write down the story that I'm telling myself. I analyze it. And then I ask myself, is this thought true? How would I show up if I didn't believe this? Oh, I would just, I would take that action anyways. I would book that call. I would, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. So we really have to look at the stories we're telling ourselves and ask ourselves, is it true? Ask people around us that we trust, is it true? Um, and take the action anyways, prove yourself wrong, prove your imposter syndrome wrong. Heather, when is your book coming out and where can people find it? Yeah, so the book comes out officially on March 8th. Um, we're going to have some pre-order, some really good pre-order incentives um, the middle of February. Definitely go to my website, heatherchauvin.com. The last name is spelled C-H-A-U-V-I-N.com. Um, you should be able to find it anywhere online and Instagram as well. My name, Heather Chauvin, and the podcast, Mom is in Control. So Heather, can you share your social media links so people can reach out to you? Yes, Instagram, Heather Chauvin. Um, that's my most active one. Or you could just find me on Facebook, same name. Um, yeah. And for our listeners, we'll have the link to her, her, everything dealing with her book release and her social media on the show notes. You find the show notes at www.heavenstatesallblah.com. And be sure to share this episode across social media. So Heather, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? I always say to people, if you're listening to this, there's something inside of you that's trying to get your attention and just to pay attention to that and to lean into the breadcrumbs. You know, we're so all or nothing. I'm either on the couch or I'm running a marathon. And eventually you have to surrender to the process that it's daily action and showing up. Uh, showing up for 10 minutes is better than not showing up at all. And you need to invest in yourself. You cannot do this alone. You cannot pretend that you can do it all. Um, nobody does. And if they say they do, they're lying. And it's okay to be scared um, and to take action anyways. Heather, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. I love this conversation. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.